Dr. Linda, great to have you on the show today. How are you? I'm doing well, David. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm in lower Manhattan today. You're in Scottsdale, Arizona. Is that right? Yes. Scottsdale, Arizona. Very sunny. It's already like 85 today. It's it's a little warm. I've only been there once. It was lovely. It's gorgeous. November to April is the most amazing time, I would say, for sure. Weather's always gorgeous. Well, you only got a couple of months. And then, yes, and then uh, it cools off. So. I'm having you on today so that we can help clarify for my people some terminologies and differences talking about different kinds of medicine. And you studied osteopathic medicine, functional medicine. So I want to sort of go through what these different things are. What's the difference between somebody who has a DO at the end of your name versus somebody who has an MD or I guess a chiropractor? What does a chiropractor have? Like a CO? DC. DC, DC. Okay, so mm -hmm. we, have, we got three different descriptors here. So what is a DO? Very good question. So a DO is an osteopathic physician. We are very similar in our training to an MD. So we go through four years of undergrad, then we sit for the same board exams to get to MD or DO school. Then we go on and either we differentiate there. So DOs will learn osteopathic manipulation and focus on a mind, body, spirit philosophy. So putting the whole person as one entity. And so that theory is what carries on throughout our years of education. Osteopathic manipulation, I like to describe it. If you were to fuse the modalities of a chiropractor, physical therapist, we do similar modalities. So I use my hands to help adjust patients. I help relax the muscles to help the spine realign. Most of us are trained in what you call like popping someone's back. So that we call that HVLA. I do a lot of soft tissue techniques as well. And you'll start to see even different practices of chiropractors, physical therapists, massage therapists use similar techniques. And it's really all of these, there's, I believe, over 200 different types of techniques that we use to help basically help the patient heal and help reduce their pain. And how does that intersect with functional medicine? So DOs, if you will, functional medicine is obviously that mind-body-spirit approach. Functional medicine is a different philosophy in general of practicing medicine where we go the next step. So yes, it's intertwining the entire patient, their mind, body, spirit, but also understanding the root cause of the healthcare issues. So going deeper, using the biology systems will bring in genetics, lifestyle modifications, understanding hormones. All of these factors go into understanding how someone wor is working functionally in their body. And so it's an additional set of courses that one takes. Um, there's some people who will take courses and not exactly get the fellowship training, but there are fellowship training tracks as well. So patients can look more for a provider who does fellowship training to know that they're more credible than just reading a few books or reading some articles and calling themselves functional medicine. I see. So there would be a certification at the end of the process. Does that get you more yeah. letters at the end of the name? How do I, how do it I It does. Know? Yes, it does get okay. more letters and not everyone has to do it. So right now there's not, anyone can call themselves a functional provider if they've taken a few basic courses. So those who actually get the, the fellowship training, it's anywhere from a two to four year journey where you're taking hours and hours of courses. So most courses are about 30 plus hours, each course that you do. And most of them are done live or a live streaming situation. And I think it's not always transparent to patients. So if those are seeking out a functional medicine trained provider, there's different accredible resources such as Integrative of Functional Medicine. So IFM.org, they list all of their providers that have taken their courses and those that are and distinguished who are actually certified. So have actually taken the board exam. So sitting for a six hour board exam and then getting that additional certification showing that they do have proficiency in functional medicine. Because otherwise you can just say you are without actually gotcha. 100%. Okay. 100%. So it's not always transparent to the patient who is and isn't. Right. So I, I do empower my patients to ask their providers. I've even challenged some of my current patients that have had functional medicine providers said, well, what are they? And then they later have come back, well, they, they're a dentist and they're doing functional medicine, which they're allowed to, but that wasn't exactly transparent to them in the very beginning. They had to do some research. So I always empower my patients to know who's giving you that education just so that way you know what level they're giving it to you at. And then integrative medicine, what's that? Integrative medicine is a holistic mindset. So mind, body, spirit. 
They focus a lot on lifestyle changes and treating the whole person. And they'll recommend things like more homeopathy, so herbals and supplements and botanicals. They, of course, recommend lifestyle changes, which is a key with functional medicine as well, lifestyle changes. But they don't address the root cause as much as functional medicine. So the root cause is really what makes functional medicine a little bit different. Okay, let's go to root cause. Uh, yeah. So I come in to see you and I say... Dr. Linda, I sort of feel okay, but I think I could feel better or, or whatever. Like I just come in to see you yearly for my physical. Okay. So what do you do to assess me? So to assess you, it depends on, we're going to look at your genetics. We're going to look at what maybe you feel isn't right. So whether that's your sleeping patterns, whether that's your energy at the beginning of the day or the end of the day, or whether that be past lab work that you've had. But, you know, one good, one good example I'd like to give my patients is prediabetes. So maybe if you also had a marker with an elevated sugar or an elevated hemoglobin A1C, which is a measurement of what tells us how much sugar is attached to red blood cells and puts someone at risk for diabetes. So say if you had an elevated A1C. Put a number on that. What's elevated A1C? Please? Yeah. So elevated A1C is anything over 5.7% and stops at 6.4%. So it's that small range before we hit diabetes at 6.5%. And so say you're right there at 5.7%, meaning that you just hit that category. So that means your sugars overall are a little bit elevated. Instead of just saying, well, you could lose some weight, cut back on your carbs and sugars. I'm going to dive a little bit deeper and say, well, why do you have that? Let's look at your family history. Let's look at your genetics. Let's see how many family members have had prediabetes or diabetes. Let's also go a step further. Let's look at your leptin levels, which tell me a little bit more about how hungry you get and your ability to stay full. Let's look at your insulin fasting levels, because that's going to tell me what you're doing when you don't eat and how high your sugar is. And there's a slew of other labs that we can look at as well to dive a little bit deeper. And then I would go into the patient's lifestyle. I always ask my patients, give me a 24-hour food recall. You'll be... <laughs> So surprised at how, what people have eaten in the last 24 hours. You know, are they eating enough calories and quality calories, such as fresh fruit, vegetables, lean meat, low carbohydrates or sugars? Are they drinking a lot of juice? Are they drinking a lot of soda? Are they consuming a lot of artificial sweeteners or food dyes? These are all things that we're going to kind of look at. And then I also want to assess movement. Are they moving? Movement is such a key foundation of life. We were never engineered to be sedentary people. We were always engineered to be moving. So I always like to make sure my patients are moving, whether that be walking a half mile, a mile a day, or my athletes who are running, you know, five miles a day. So I want to look at the lifestyle of the patient as well. Sometimes we might go even further looking at trauma history, and that can be emotional, physical, it could be a big car accident. It could be a house burning down. It could be divorce. It could be even going back to childhood, you know, divorce of parents or other traumas as a child. So I'll even take that a next step further and ask about the history of the patient. All of these things, believe it or not, can contribute to something, what we believe as simple as prediabetes. So it's kind of going to the whole patient picture and really identifying what areas we can work on to help the patient. You seem like a very tolerant person. I would make a terrible doctor. I think, it's, I think if somebody came into me and they were drinking, my big bugbear is Mountain Dew. Oh, it should be like a controlled substance. Yeah, uh, that and Doritos. <laughs> Doritos, he said, there's actually something solid there, but equally bad. Yeah, um, I would just say, you stop that now, or you're not my patient anymore. Like, oh goodness, yeah. Like just like I can't do anything if you're doing yeah. this. You know, it, it's interesting through my journey of being a provider. I realized my role with patients it may not be the typical physician, but that's what makes me a little special. So you can, you know, criticize someone right in front of them, or you can just be accepting and say, "Well, I think you've got an addiction to Mountain Dew. Let's <laughs> uh, let's see how we can cut back on this." And I like to work with my patients. I use shared uh, patient decision making so we can kind of identify goals that are attainable for them. I don't like to dictate. I like to work with a patient. So when patients feel empowered, empowered to improve their health, empowered to help heal themselves and give them help, it's, it's a really powerful experience. And I found that that works better than just saying, here's a medication. And so in a patient like addicted to Mountain Dew or other soft drinks, I kind of say, okay, well, how many are you drinking? So if they're drinking four, you know, bottles a day, that's like, I guess what the 16 ounce bottles a day. Okay. 
let's work on this week. Can we cut back by half a bottle, you know, or a bottle? And I kind of say, what do you think that you could do? Okay, I could cut back to three bottles this week. It's these little improvements that oh. letting the patients feel like they still have that control. Right, right. I think is really what it is because as a provider, we could just totally tell patients what to do all day long. And I realized I had zero success. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> zero. And when I gave patients someone that control back and we said, okay, what can mm. we work on? It's worked. I, I have had other patients uh, use soda addictions of different sort too, that we got them down to one soda drink a, a day, which is phenomenal. And then we were able to work on some of the other things, some of the other sugar addictions, reducing some of the carbohydrates, replacing some of the processed refined breads with like a whole wheat sourdough bread, things that are good for the gut health, you know, kind of working with them in different avenues. And then finally, they were able to let go of that soda. They didn't need it. They didn't crave it. You're a nicer person than I am. <laughs> I'm not a doctor. Something I just did the other day is I got myself, I'm in Manhattan and the water yeah. is really quite good. However, yeah. there's this whole microplastics thing, right? Oh, so, goodness. Yes. And I've been reading the statistics on this, how it's dramatically accelerated in the last five years. Yes. Uh, and the, the organ of choice is the brain where it accumulates. It's like fourfold in the brain versus any of the other organs. I got myself a little countertop water filter thingy to like remove microplastics. Yes. I have this tiny little apartment and I have two air filters in it because there's an expressway outside my window. All right. And I think that the toxin level, which is something I always used to sort of like Poo poo. I think it's pretty real. What's your approach to these? Yeah. So the plastic is a big issue, especially with females, more so because it, plastics, when they enter our body, you know, they, they kind of stay there and they actually mimic estrogens. So a lot more younger females are having issues with fertility because they might develop in what we call an estrogen dominant state as mm -hmm. these plastics mimic an estrogen like septic so they actually bind to the receptors you have a lot more free floating estrogen in the body it can also cause issues with just hormone regulation so you might see you know go up the chain so the thyroid might, might start to be affected as well and then it affects the liver so then the liver can't detoxify so then you can actually create and hold on to these really toxic level of hormones. So there's toxic estrogens that can further actually later down the road in a woman's life be a predisposition to cancer, breast cancer mm -hmm. and uterine ovarian cancers. And then in men, you'll see this as well, but in a different state. So they will more likely have just a, a lot more obesity too. Women will also get obese from these plastics. And that's a huge trigger for lifestyle issues, really. And yes, we get a lot through our water. The ways that I kind of tell my patients, unfortunately, we live in a lifestyle where you can't 100% avoid plastic. I don't, unless if you go move to a private island and, and you just read everything yourself grow everything, control everything. I don't think there's a way to fully remove it because even things like plastic retainers to keep our teeth straight after spending thousands and thousands of dollars, you know, alignment of our teeth, you're going to still absorb some of those plastics. Food packaging, you can't, you might buy the food in plastic, right? So you have frozen fruits and things like that. It's, it's hard to get 100% plastic away from our foods. But you can do things in your lifestyle to help avoid these things. Yes, the water filtration system is great. In Arizona, our water is terrible. So I've grown up with reverse osmosis, actually, since I was a little kid, because our water is undrinkable from the taps. Yeah, it's, it's terrible. Some people even go step further out here because we have such hard water is actually get a whole house filtration system, which also removes the plastics. So if you do those counter pop reverse osmosis or purification systems, those I know are a little bit smaller. Just make sure that it is specific to remove plastics. The full large scale reverse osmosis, those all do remove the plastics from our drinking water. A lot of people love the Stanley cups. They're metal on the inside, which is great, but the straw is plastic. So uh, replacing that straw with a metal straw. Is there a test for, I mean, until you're dead and they do an autopsy on you and see how much plastics in your brain. Yeah. Is there a test for microplastics? There is. I have not seen it mainstream. It's a functional medicine. We have a couple of different tests through different labs. I don't want to say I'm biased to one in particular, um, but they will, especially with hormone panels, that is something that is tracked mm -hmm. is plastics. 
some will label it specifically label it as like a plastic toxin so they'll label out that and others you'll see that in the byproduct of the hormone panels that are done but through functional medicine specific labs there are availability to do that it'll be through the blood <laughs> and urine option too sorry to be down like microplastic forever. no it's big you know how do you get rid of it? There's not really a way to fully get rid of the plastics once they're in your body. There is ways to help minimize it, but at this time, there's no clear detoxification process. So a lot of it that we focus on in functional medicine is detoxing the liver. If we help with certain herbal vitamins, supplements, whether it be a shake or some tablets, we kind of help to detoxify our organs a little bit, but also things like foods that are really wonderful at helping our bodies to naturally detox and clean up and remove. So fiber, phenomenal, like fresh fruits and vegetables are going to help remove any waste in our body. Broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, cabbage. That's also why kimchi is such a great fermented product. Not only does it give a good gut health, but it also helps with detoxification. Kimchi is wonderful. So these things naturally, when food is going to not move well through our body without enough fiber and water. So when you are adequately eliminating your waste, that along will come out some of the toxins too. But there's no clear way that we have at this moment to say, hey, you're going to take this and eliminate all the plastics from your body. One day, I'm hoping we'll find that source, that ability to do that. It's just really living a clean, healthy lifestyle. Also, believe it or not, sweating is very important. And so whether that be cardiovascular exercise, sweating out the toxins that way from your body, or even like hot saunas will be helpful as well that kind of help that detoxification. Yeah, I'm a big fan of themes and saunas and yeah. all that. Because yeah. I do it because I sleep better and I... Yes. Sleeping. So yes. Well, in, in Arizona, most of our summer, you just go sit in your car for two minutes. Oh, yeah. Give yourself a <laughs> free sauna. That's right. Get a black car, just put it in your driveway, sit in there. That'll do just it. Just sit in there for two minutes and then turn the air on and, and then you're good to go. Right. So I got a practical question. You yes. know, like, this is not yeah. medical advice. So I'm just curious. Yes. My liver labs have been elevated for some time, at least yeah. five years. So my ALT, my AST is like well, out. I mean, it's not dangerously out, but it's just like, yeah, it could be better. So what would you do for me? So one of the things that I always recommend is just looking back at the history. So I'm going to see kind of what happened when your labs start, first started to become elevated. So looking at that piece, we'll look at ultrasound of the liver is very helpful too, to see if there's anything happening with the liver or the organs around the liver. There's a specific lab that you go deeper with as well. One of the labs that we don't check too often is GGT, which is a liver specific lab that's not part of our CMP, our complete metabolic profile. If alkaline phosphatase is elevated, there's actually even a lab where we can do as well through blood that breaks out the three type of isoenzymes that tells you, is it brain, liver, or intestinal source of elevation too? Because there's not just there's actually multiple labs for the liver. We just mainly look at two or three, but there are more than that. Then I would look at your history of diet. So diet, is there any alcohol use? Is there any concerns for fatty liver disease, which is generally caused from too much carbohydrates and sugars and how your body's metabolizing those? I'd look at your triglycerides, which is part of your cholesterol panel to see if that's elevated because when the triglycerides are elevated, it can also indirectly put fat into the liver and cause those numbers to go up as well. Um, I'd also look at family history too, because if it's just a mild elevation, all of that else is normal, lifestyle is great. Sometimes we're out of those normal ranges because those normal ranges are meant for a standard deviation of people. Not everyone fits 100% in that range. So I'd also want to just make sure I'm looking at that family history, that genetic tree, just to see is it that everyone in the family has had that a little bit elevated at a certain point in their life, but the workup's entirely normal too. And those would be kind of the approaches that I would do just big blanket wise is, is kind of looking at those pieces. If you were a patient of mine. And do you get people coming in? I would say pre-diabetes is symptomatic at that point, but people who yeah. are not symptomatic, they're just sort of like, yeah, everything's about okay but they want to get the best that they can be. I'm a concierge provider. So I do work with patients at a different level. So I get to dive deep into their history. I would say more than I did before I had this role as a concierge medical provider. So a lot of my patients that I'm getting now are 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds that want to maintain their health. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at is 
people mm-hmm. that say, I, I think I'm fine, but I just want to maintain the health I have. And some of my patients are high level executives. So they've had a very high stress level job. So I might do what I call an executive physical. So I'm going to get a little additional test and I'm going to look at their heart deeper. I might get a CT calcium score to look at how much plaque is built up in their heart, a stress test, seeing how hard when their heart's under, when their heart is under stress, such as exercise so physical stress, are they maintaining good perfusion, which is good blood flow through the heart. Because when you've had a high, high stress job, that puts all sorts of inflammation in different organs. So my patients are coming to me wanting to know that. Surprisingly, a lot of my patients in their their 40s and the 50s have also been asking for whole body MRIs, which is now available here in Arizona. Patients actually can get that without a doctor's order here in Arizona. A lot of them will, the facilities will have them meet with one of their providers after if they don't have an established primary care to go over the results with them. But I've had some patients do that and they'll get MRIs of almost all of their organs. So it's kind of head to pelvic area and then it, it, not the arms or the legs. So not those joints. How, how helpful is that? Are people identifying issues? Are they? Yeah. So some of my patients, we've identified that they do have arthritis in their spine. So some early arthritis in their neck or their low back. So their cervical lumbar spine. I've had, you know, one patient that we picked up that there was a, a small liver cyst. We later proved that it was a cyst, so benign mass, but at the time it did look slightly suspicious. So we got some more dedicated imaging to confirm that that was benign, so non-cancerous. I've had some patients where we picked up that they had a mildly enlarged prostate. So we're picking up BPH, benign hypertrophy of the prostate a little earlier. So now we can actually put in some recommendations, whether we haven't actually followed up yet on that particular patient, but perhaps maybe some herbal supplements that help reduce the size of the prostate or some medications, depending on the patient's preference. So me being functional and traditional, I can give patients options and we talk through risks and benefits to see what would be the best for them, which I love bringing in those two. So it kind of it gives us some insight. I've not had any patient, we do that, and then all of a sudden they have cancer. It would show, but I have not had any patients with that level of surprise. Most of it's just been some small findings of, oh, yeah, okay, we're going to keep a small watch on this. So it gives a lot of peace of mind, especially patients that have had friends or family members die of certain cancers or other pathologies, and it gives a, an overall screening. And how do you feel about the blood-based cancer tests, the GRAIL tests? and The GRAIL tests, tests, yeah. So I have implemented that, and there are quite a few patients that the risk factors for cancer are quite high. And there's not a lot of good screening for some of these tests, such as pancreatic cancer. You can do an MRI every couple of years if they are high-risk patients, but even the guidelines don't really support that at this moment because it is kind of a mysterious cancer that all of a sudden comes up on a lot of people. We find it more when it's too late. So having a blood test and specific patients over the age of 50 can be very helpful at detecting stages one, two, three, or four cancer. And obviously we want to detect in stages one or two so that the biggest interventions can happen. And so I think it's a, a really exciting test that's available to patients through the, the ordering of their physician. And I think it can give a lot of insight and also, again, peace of mind because people would rather find these tests out and get anything done early and really prevent. So I think it's an exciting adventure. It'll be interesting to see how that test in particular, how it starts to change the dynamics of other screening tests as well, because other people are also now doing blood-based cancer screening tests, you know? So it kind of is changing the front line for preventative health, which is amazing. What I've noticed yeah. is that in my primary care, that's like, here, you need to do this. And I've seen, interestingly enough, that speaking of preventative care, some of the insurance companies are now offering it for free and saying, here, you can take this test, which is really interesting sort of change of philosophy there on their part. I think it is a little change in philosophy. You know, healthcare has changed a lot and I'm hoping to see positive changes more in the future. I hope that there's more of a support for preventative health because right now a lot of what we do in medicine is the opposite. We've put band-aids or fixes on things that are an issue at the moment versus saying this is slightly elevated, or this is going to this pathway, should we intervene now? And so I think it's great that they started to pick on that. It's very small amount in Arizona. None of the insurance plans are paying for it at this moment. 
some employers might start paying for it as well if they know that their their staff is healthy. And so I think we'll start to see that change over the next couple of years, especially as more types of tests like this become available mm. or more screening tests. Um, because then it really, if we can intervene sooner, we can spend less money on health and actually have healthier people. That's right. You mentioned a heart blood flow test. What is that? If I yeah, want to know. Yeah. How well is my heart pumping blood? There's a couple of things, but I, I think one of the great tests that a lot of patients have been doing for years is a cardiac stress test. So the most standard one is where you'll go to a cardiologist's office. They're going to hook you up to a machine for those who are physically able to run or speed walk on a treadmill. And you're hooked up to different monitors. Then they're going to put you to your max. So get your heart rate up to its max potential. And then they will actually look at the heart with an, with an echo cardiogram, which is an mm. ultrasound of the heart, and to see how much blood flow is going around the heart. So we have all of these amazing arteries around the heart that give the heart its blood supply. So although the heart's pushing blood out, it also has to have its own blood supply to stay healthy and strong. When we have cardiovascular disease, which is build up in the heart arteries, that's what puts us at risk for a heart attack. So the stress test is going to show us when your heart is under the most severe stress, your heart is up there, you are stressed out physically, how much blood flow are you getting to every single chamber of your heart? All four chambers are get strong blood flow. That's great. If they see a defect, as in one area, the heart's not getting as much perfusion, then the cardiologist would talk with the patient about what next steps would be. But that really gives us a really great assessment of the heart. Now, it is an expensive test. Insurance does have to cover it. Some cardiologists will partner with primary cares or other providers to do a cash price. That is an option. I've even seen basically cash price cardiology clinics around here, or even mobile units that they only accept cash pricing for it. So one day, I hope that more patients will have access to that. Um, because I think it's a great test. The CT of the heart is a, mm. uh, a little more affordable test. And, and that's, I would say, a small window of prevention. That one here in Arizona, it's about $115 self-pay. Not all insurance companies, most don't pay for it, but it's 115 bucks. And that looks at just how much plaque is built up in the heart, which is really fascinating. Um, I've had some patients with a very small number, but if that plaque is soft and, and moves off the heart wall, that can cause a stroke, a very high number. I've had patients with very high numbers, but they'd been on statins for years. And that number was much higher because how thick that plaque was in the heart, but also how calcified because it was old mm -hmm. and stable. Mm -hmm. And so their, their risk of cardiovascular disease and having a heart attack was actually very low after they went under, went a cardiac catheterization under the cardiologist care. So, you know, so it kind of gives us different windows. There's a lot of tests available. So to kind of look at our health and wellness. Speaking as a DO practicing functional medicine, I'm going to ask you one of the more divisive things around here are statins. The world seems to be divided into statin haters and statin lovers. Yeah. Now, what's your feeling on statins? So I'm more middle of the ground. I don't put every patient on a statin. I, since I've been practicing medicine, I've seen it where very few people were on statins to everyone almost was on a statin to now a little bit more relaxed. So statins are great at reducing inflammation, specifically inflammation of the plaque buildup in the heart arteries. And if whether I believe they're a great medication for the right patient, there's of course risks with every medication we give. So, so my patients that have had known cardiovascular disease, so they've had a heart attack, they've had a stroke, that are specific from, you know, plaque buildup, we're going to recommend a statin for them. Those who have a very high, strong family history of heart attacks, we're going to recommend a statin for them. Those whose cholesterol is extremely high, we're going to recommend statins for them. And maybe even my moderate who have a lot of risk factors. Other patients of mine, I respect it if they choose not to go on a statin. We have a shared decision-making conversation. And we'll work a lot with lifestyle. So that's reducing their inflammation as much as we can naturally. Um, movement, of course, so we instill uh, exercise. I'll recommend with patients to do you just healthy, clean diet, lean meat. You know, if they do really want red meat, we'll try to go for like a bison or something like that, or a venison, things that are a little bit more gamey and more natural that have a little bit more better health properties. So I kind of work with my patients to see not everyone in, in my practice gets a statin, but those who it's clinically indicated for do get a statin. And yes, it is very divided. 
And I have a lot of patients that just refuse to, and I respect that. And I just work with them the best I can to help support their themselves. This is something I do not understand. The statin hater. What is the fear factor associated with the statin? Uh, I don't get it. So, oh, the statins, I think a lot of what can happen as patients age or even younger patients, if one, one of the most severe side effects of a statin is the myalgias that people can get in rhabdomyolysis, big words there. So basically statins and specific people can actually break down their own muscles. It is a severe debilitating pain. You feel like you have the flu or, or COVID, but don't have flu or COVID. Your muscles literally are tearing apart and it's then will actually destroy the kidneys because of the protein content that's having to be processed but through the kidneys. How many people is this? What's the frequency? It's tiny. I think I've only taken two patients off in 10 years. And you're going to know it right away because you're going to yes. be comfortable. Okay. So let's yes. assume you're not in like that tiny group. Yeah. Help me to understand the logic of the other statin haters. I honestly think that we over pushed a drug over like oh. as a society. I think we over pushed the medication okay. to the point that everyone needs a statin. And then people were like, no, I don't. I felt like a lot of it was just so pushed and perhaps over pushed by the pharmaceuticals and the data that we had at that time that everyone felt like everyone was going to be on a statin, if, you know, and I think that that yes or no approach as a society really doesn't mm. work well in America. Um, I think that an all or nothing approach is not, we, we aren't black and white. There's a lot of gray. And I think that when you consider the gray in between, I think that's where we become the expert, the, the art of being a medical provider. And I think just people just want to have that choice now. And, and I feel like a lot of people hear one bad thing about a drug and they think that it is bad, but no, it does save lives. It's appropriate for many patients and it does save lives. And I just think that it was maybe perhaps for quite a few years, overused, overprescribed, and people got nervous or scared saying that I have to have this. It's kind of my my two cents on how I felt from patients. That's really where I got, because when I asked the patient, why won't you take it? And a lot of times it is just what they've heard or just right. that feeling. I can't speak for other providers. You know, perhaps there is a, a study about why people say statins are the devil, but they're not the devil. They do save lives. Uh, they just have to be properly placed on the patient and also give things like CoQ10 because statins right. deplete our CoQ10. So you need CoQ10, uh, you know, a very specific enzyme to help our cells and our mitochondria function to feel better. There's a casual acquaintance of mine who's 10 years younger than me. I want to say good 80, 100 pounds overweight and it has all the usual elevated glucose. His A1C is like in the sixes. I asked him, how's your cholesterol? And he says, you know, it's a little high. And I said, well, define a little high. And I think his LDL was like 130, 140. His total was like over 200. He's like, oh, they want to put me on a statin. I'm not going to do that. And I was like, yeah. are you out of your mind? Like, yeah. what do you yeah. think? It's a good well, thing. <laughs> it is. And so this is where the functional medicine side comes in. And a patient like that, you the clinical picture is metabolic disease. Mm, right. And yeah. then also in a an aging male, we got to look at the hormones. So cholesterol, and I'm going to trigger back on this too, cholesterol is essential in the pathways to make our hormones. So if we drop someone's total cholesterol below a hundred, their total, we might actually then make them depleted of their ability to make their own hormones. It's a whole mm. pathway. Right. Cholesterol right. is essential to make our essential hormones of testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. And men and women need different balances of these. So if we overdrop the cholesterol, you're going to see a deficiency in that. And soon we're, I, I think over the next five, 10 years, we're going to be looking at other markers like APOE is a much better lab test that has been discovered, just not covered by insurance yet. There are different uh, genetic risk factors kind of are going to tell us about our, our ability to have inflammation in our body. So that'll, I'm sure that'll be coming soon in the next five, 10 years. We'll be looking at that and then perhaps medications more specific to helping reduce that risk. But in your friend's situation as well, a hormone panel would be very enlightening because as testosterone decreases, you actually then can increase your risk for prediabetes and diabetes. And so, because testosterone is essential for men. So 
that would be something else I would look at your friend. He should, you know, if he can see a hormone provider, an endocrinologist in his area, if there's a, or a functional medicine provider, or better yet, a functional medicine endocrinologist, they do exist. You know, you can get better down that role and see actually what is actually causing his dysfunction. Is it actually a hormone oh. deficiency or cortisol? It's what he eats. Oh, what he eats. What he eats. <laughs> the sad diet, the standard American diet. Yes. A lot of bacon yeah. and, and Coca-Cola. <laughs> That'll do it too. And you can't just look at someone and say, hey, it's this. But there's a lot to be said about our American diet. I know there's a really inspirational, I almost want to call him an influencer, functional medicine provider, Dr. Mike Hyman. He actually just went to Congress this past month and is really trying to make the American diet healthier you know, remove the ultra processed foods from our diet as much as possible, improve the food that we're serving our children in the public school systems. And really just saying we got to follow more what Europe does with limiting certain food additives and dyes and the amount of sugar and sugar substitutes, whether that be high fructose corn syrup, or even, you know, the artificial sweeteners from our diet. So I, I'm hoping that with the support of, of Congress at some point, like he can really make it through because it, it's really, truly inspiring. If we change our diet, we change our life. So these are all things that modifiable risk factors that we can actually change. Yeah, probably the most potent <laughs> drug that we take is on the end of your fork. It probably uh, is. It is. Yeah. Get that straight first. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Is there anything you want to tell people about the practice of osteopathic medicine, about functional medicine that you think they may not understand? As I've been a DO, I think a lot of people ask, what is the difference? And I already mentioned the difference between that, but it's a different mindset and philosophy. Most DOs are going to take the time to listen because that's how we're trained. And then you add in functional medicine, you've got a gem of a provider. Functional medicine and osteopathic medicine are all, we're trained to listen to the patient. We're trained to understand the patient and be there without judgment. I think I empower every patient and every person to find a provider that suits you well and listens to you for what you need, because I think the listening skill of us providers is our best tool to really dive through and to help the patient. Really, I, I found this journey of functional medicine, I think, and lifestyle medicine it has always been something that I've practiced myself and for my patients. You can't go through life without doing what you tell patients. And so even at a young age, if I had a health issue, such as bad heartburn from being too stressed, I worked on my diet without even realizing I was practicing that functional medicine approach. I brought in tools for patients of mine, working with them and saying, hey, let's try this instead. Let's do this. Let's really work on that, especially my young children. And I had quite a few come in that had prediabetes and they were 10 years old. Whoa. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. 10. And we're already seeing changes in, you know, in, in fatty liver disease, you know, in young teenagers, this is terrible. By taking the time and educating them and educating their parents on the food that they're eating and how that's directly affecting them is so empowering to them to actually change their trajectory of life. That young pediatric population, that young to see prediabetes and fatty liver disease, they're going to end up with liver cancer by the time that they're 50 if they did not change their ways. But by empowering them about the importance of eating fresh fruits and vegetables, empowering them to choose less processed foods, fast food, eliminate that from the diet, eliminate soda, Mountain Dew. These are all things that we can do to help improve, but also know that it's okay to have a little bit here and there. So whether I tell patients treat themselves once a week. And so I think that by really empowering people around the world, just to really find a physician that works with you and for you, and that is your advocate, I think is one of the best empowering things because they're going to help restore your health or help keep your health there. Um, and I think that's really as a society that if we don't make some changes, unfortunately, well, I think the newest statistics said, but in like within 10 to 20 years, like a quarter of the population will be like morbidly obese. I think those are just some key points that I would just always encourage patients. And what you brought up in the beginning, when looking for a provider, look at the credentials. Look uh, at the credentials. Yes. Just because someone says they practice functional medicine. I love the, like the dentist. That's pretty good. <laughs> yes. Which dentist can, but he wasn't even, that particular provider wasn't working as a dentist. He was 
operating the business. There's plenty of dentists that are actually doing functional medicine and they're kind of finding their place in the role. And so it's a really fascinating approach, but yes, look at the credentials, ask where they got certified. I mean, we didn't dive deep into mid-level providers. There's a lot of mid-level providers as well. Nurse practitioner, PA. There's also naturopath providers. I believe their initials are NM, all different levels of training. So know where your provider's at. Know that an MD and a DO have the most level of training. They've also gone on to residency. So they have a minimum of three years. And if they've done fellowship at another two to five, depending what their fellowship is. So we are the most educated providers. But all of these other providers do have a role in medicine and they all have their piece to the puzzle to help the patient heal. Just knowing who you're seeing and how they can best help you is really, I think, what I empower everyone to know. That's right. Dr. Linda, thank you so much. Give my best to my good friend, Dr. Connie Mariano, the the White House doctor, one of the more inspirational people I know to work with. And thank you so much. You know, a lot of us just get caught up in the jargon. What's an osteopathic and yep. functional integrative, I mean, what do all these things mean? And I think having a little bit of understanding of the jargon allows us to be able to find the sort of practitioner that we want. There's always the sort of like the wall of the jargon. You Once you get yeah. past that, you can make certain decisions. But before that, it's all confusing and it can just lead to this paralysis of like, what do I do? A hundred percent. And never be afraid to ask, like, can you tell me a little bit more about, and that gives you some engagement as well. And and to be empowered to know who's taking care of you again. Yes, David, thank you. (laughs) The jargon is confusing, but I always just empower patients. If you don't know, ask. If you feel like you can't ask that person, maybe they're not the first person to be taking care of you. If you feel like you can't ask those questions. That's right. And don't be afraid to ask the question, why? So yeah, ask why. Why ask do you why. feel that way? Or why, why, why is why, this? Why is this? Why do you want this for me? And yep. if they blow you off, they're probably not the right provider for you. So. I, yeah, correct. A hundred percent. Thank you so much, Dr. Linda. Thank you, David. I appreciate you so much. Have a wonderful day. You bet. Take care now. Bye-bye.